And that's why, like, it's brilliant, like that we have these pressures, the fees are going up, people are starting to get uncomfortable. That's what gives the impetus for people to be like, I'm going to install a Lightning wallet on my phone for the exchanges that have been like, I mean, Coinbase has been resisting it forever. Same with Binance and all the big exchanges, like the, the exchanges that have been cutting edge, that are kind of like, you know, s- uh, slower players, and they're probably going to win in the long run, to be honest. They have been implementing Lightning for quite a while, like um, Bitfinex, Kraken. And it's it's kind of like the big ones that have been running these casinos. They're the ones that are finally coming around now. And that, I think, is closing the circle almost. I think that, you know, once once these last chains are starting to be Lightning compatible, people are going to really experience the power of Lightning. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm here with Tur Demeester. Tur, I want to start off by saying uh, we've been having these conversations for quite a few years now. I was looking back and our first chat was in 2017. And I was like, oh, my God, it's been it's been so many years already. Uh, welcome back to the show. It is so awesome having you here. You just come with a wealth of information. So great to have you. Happy to be here. And you're right. I mean, that's like six years ago. That was uh, that was a different time. Although, interestingly enough, weirdly, some of these debates are coming back now, like the block size and stuff like that. Anyway, I'm sure we can talk about it. Well, that's where I, that's exactly where I want to start. Because, yeah, I think in our first conversation, we were probably talking about how fees were high, how you needed to have some type of solution that was, you know, second layer for immediate settlement, low fees. And here we are back with inscriptions now uh, happening on the base layer and lots of people saying, oh, my God, uh, like what's happening? And you're seeing all the OGs kind of just smirk. So. What are you, what are your thoughts on inscriptions? This is both of us smirking right now for the audio <laughs> listeners. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, and and the nice thing is that back then we were saying these things of like, yes, so you know we cannot do everything on the base layer. It's just just how protocols work in general. You have to um, engineer these things with a particular function for a particular layer, and if you have a different function, you build another layer on top. That's how you scale. You know, you're you're um, the foundations of a building have a particular function. That's not where you're going to hang the picture, right? The picture is going to be on the first floor, the second floor. So, but back then, the challenge was that the Lightning Network had been conceived, um, which is the the payment layer on top of Bitcoin. Theoretically, it had been conceived, but it wasn't built yet. And now, six years later, it's actually here. Uh, we have over five thousand Bitcoin that are circulating at massively rapid speeds in uh, in that Lightning layer. And especially, I think that's going to be important for this year, is uh, large exchanges are starting to implement it. And they're motivated by these high fees because they also pay a part of that. And they know they can lose customers if they're going to charge $10 per, you know, if you you have $50 worth of Bitcoin and you get a $10 withdrawal fee, that's really heavy. Or $20. I mean, who knows where it's going to go this year? So it's a, it's a problem that is solving itself. and But it's true, on the other hand, that a lot of people have the same question. And I think it's understandable because there's always a bit of an eternal September that happens in, in uh, Bitcoin where there's always newcomers. Uh, there's always new people that need to be educated. And so it's it's great that people are asking these questions. I love the example of not hanging the picture on the foundation. And you have so many people that are literally trying to buy the picture and it literally put it on the foundation of Bitcoin. Talk to us about what inscriptions are and when this became uh, capable to even do on the base layer. And because I think there's people that hear inscriptions and they have no idea what we're even talking about. So give them a little bit of context and kind of your thoughts in, at large at what this is and what it means. Actually, I've been leaning back about this. I haven't dug in deep because I felt like, you know, from the get go, it seemed like an odd thing to do on the main layer. I do think in the main layer can be a place for preservation, like, you know, literally what you inscribe on the main Bitcoin blockchain could be stored for hundreds of years. So there there is a there is a a meaning to it potentially. but I, I haven't taken the deep dive. I, I still felt like I was a bit of a hype. So maybe maybe you can take my role here and, and uh, share a bit with the audience what you've learned so far. And we can kind of uh, uh, tennis a little bit about this. Yeah, I mean, just in general. So the the intention is, is that the storage in each block is for transactions. I think uh, I don't think that 
there was an intention for some of that storage on the base layer blocks to be used for things beyond payment. But uh, through the latest updates with the Taproot update and uh, SegWit and some of these other things, that there's now a way that you can actually inscribe uh, data into the the base layer. You're going to pay a fee to do it. And as we're as we're finding out, I think there's 150 blocks or something like. I mean, it's a really high number that are in the queue of the mempool waiting to be to be broadcast. You know, broadcast yeah. on the network and then inscribed in the ledger uh, yeah. forever. Mm. Yeah. So, so in in a way, it doesn't even really matter what it is that the, these people are wanting to inscribe. Like clearly, it's related to some kind of a perceived idea of scarcity like a there's a, there's a collector's value to having something particular inscribed in a particular block and then you get to claim something uh, i mean people have always you know for for status uh sake like people have built statues in the past and all kinds of things that cost money and that that don't have like clear utility uh other than to like say something about the author or the owner um, and so I think it's actually really interesting to think about, you know, the quote unquote waste, because there is a there is an ongoing concern that the Bitcoin block rewards are getting less and less every four years. So so this is what people generally think about when they think about mining Bitcoin is that there's new Bitcoins being minted and are given to the miners. And then on top of that, there's transaction fees that are earned by the miners. But for the first, I don't know, five, six years, there were so little transactions happening that there were no fees, basically. Um, and so that was the reward. But then the concern has been, well, if this keeps going, and and the the new bitcoins get less and less because we know it's going to stop at 21 million so by uh probably in, in about 20 years from now it's the, the new supply is uh, is going to be virtually zero already and so we wouldn't worry like well how are the miners going to keep making enough money to build that firewall to keep protecting bitcoin um to to have enough hash power and and, and throw enough electricity at the network to deter attackers and the answer is, is of course fees right transaction fees um and so you could argue that when transaction fees are artificially low, say, for example, in a bear market, people will come up with some kind of use for the main blockchain, whatever it is, it's ordinals or it's NFTs or whatever, some smart contract that sounds funny or fancy or or, or profitable, and they'll they'll stick it on the blockchain. And in a way, they'll clog up the slowly the, the mempool until it's high enough, which is the mempool, by the way, is like the queue, the queue of transactions. Um, until finally the blocks are getting full and the fees go up again. So in a way, you could say it's a self-regulating mechanism. If there's not enough naturally occurring, just very kind of pragmatic transactions, that there's other uses that are, you know, eventually generating profits for the miners. So, so it's a it's an argument to say that rather than calling this spam and we have to fight it at all costs. We can just be like, look, the, the the block size is fixed. Like blocks are never going to be more than about four megabytes in size. And so, yeah, let them throw whatever in those blocks because it's going to help us um, uh, fund the Bitcoin firewall. So Dylan LeClaire had a uh, tweet yesterday that I think encapsulates my opinion and probably your opinion <laughs> quite well. He wrote, Bitcoin has a security budget problem. Fees aren't sufficient. It needs tail emissions, which is the argument that people were making when the fees were too low. Now that the fees are really high, this is the continuation of his uh, tweet. Bitcoin has a throughput problem. Fees are too high. It needs bigger blocks. And so then he writes, your inherent desire for human intervention at every turn is exactly what Bitcoin solved. Please just shut up. <laughs> <laughs> that's it like people should like print that on a poster and hang it on the wall or something or it should be like a one of those car stickers you know mm -hmm. sailor did an interview and he was talking about how not tinkering with the base layer and it being so difficult to implement changes at this point in in the process at the base layer is akin to not being able to tinker with the laws of physics and and how everything can be built and constructed upon such a base layer because people can base their development and base their engineering around these things that are core principles 
that aren't going to be changed. And it really goes to Dylan's quote that he that he has there. And I, I really challenge people to think about how important that is. Your inherent desire for human intervention at every turn is exactly what Bitcoin solves. It's something exactly. we can build upon. Yeah, and and you know, the Bitcoin's immutability is its bedrock. Like that is what everything is built on. And so what you're saying, exactly what you're saying is Satoshi intuited this. There's this this brilliant little throwaway uh, message that he wrote on the on the forums back in 2010, I think, where he's like comparing Bitcoin to a boring gray metal. He's like, imagine a boring gray metal that has like no no clear use in industry or, or technology. Um, it's just sitting there. The only properties it has is that it's scarce and you can send it through a, a communications channel. Like you can send it around digitally at very low cost. Like what would happen? Well, that, you know, he was referring to Bitcoin, right? So he, mm -hmm. in his mind, Bitcoin is like one of the atomic elements. It's like a boring gray metal with fixed properties that you can just send around the world. Uh, and so, yeah, it's a mutability. And this is a learning process. People have to understand. They're so used to everything being that you can engineer everything. And, and we mm -hmm. come from a financial paradigm where literally you want higher interest rates. We're just going to sit in a room and push a button and the interest rates are higher. Like we can, you know, we're like the 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 Wizards of Oz, like the, the man behind the curtain. Like we're so used to having that man around. So I think it's understandable that people are trying to, whenever they're anxious about something, they think the, the protocol needs to be tinkered with. I was at the MicroStrategy conference uh, last week, and I had the pleasure of having a one-on-one -on -one chat with Michael uh, Saylor. And I, I said to Michael, I says, well, how about from like an attack standpoint with the inscriptions and they're just inundating it with endless supply of fiat? And he just kind of like smiled and he says, OK, so now they're incentivizing use of the Lightning Network and uh, everybody kind of moving to building that out and loading that up with additional channels so that they can transact with near, you know, frictionless fees on layer two. He's like, so it's a win. It's a win for layer two. And I just kind of like smile and I was like going back to things that you and I have been talking about for years, it just seems like. Every attack made on Bitcoin is an opportunity for it to grow and expand and become stronger um, in the area that maybe the attacker isn't thinking is, is necessary. And then it, it doesn't even address the fact that these higher fees are going straight into the pockets of miners that then are either retaining that in Bitcoin or buying more rigs to deploy in the lowest cost energy environment or location possible. So, you know, I, I don't, I don't necessarily know whether the whole inscription thing is good or bad, but whenever I'm looking at this idea of not intervening and not messing with the code, it seems like the build, it, it naturally incentivizes building in, in places where it needs to happen. Right. I mean, Bitcoin is an ecosystem with clear rules. And so if you put stress on an ecosystem like that, it's going to grow around it and 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 creatively build around the problem and 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 that's why like it's brilliant like that we have these pressures the fees are going up people are starting to get uncomfortable that's what gives the impetus for people to be like i'm gonna install a lightning wallet on my phone for the exchanges that have been like i mean coinbase has been resisting it forever same with binance and all the big exchanges like the, the exchanges that have been cutting edge that are kind of like, you know, s uh, slower players, and they're probably going to win in the long run, to be honest. They have been implementing Lightning for quite a while, like um, Bitfinex, Kraken. And it's it's kind of like the big ones that have been running these casinos. They're the ones that are finally coming around now. And that, I think, is closing the circle almost. I think that, you know, once once these last chains are starting to be lightning compatible people are going to really experience the power of lightning and i think you could even make the argument that would el salvador have adopted bitcoin if lightning wasn't around because mm -hmm. as far as i understand i think chivo was integrated with lightning so that if people wanted to buy 20 dollars worth of bitcoin or 10 dollars worth of bitcoin it would um you know maybe they had some kind of centralized they were like the central relay or something but but I, I think that's important, you know, the, these kind of things, uh, they're little stepping stones. Um, so, yeah, and sometimes people just have to kind of 
experience network effects for themselves like it it uh yeah, or, or 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 logarithmic uh, evolution of things. Like, yeah, it's growing at twenty percent a year, but they don't think it's fast enough. It's like, well, let's give it a few years, and you'll see what that means. Yeah, yeah. I had a moment recently talking about layer one versus layer two. So, uh, I was using Noster. Everybody's familiar with basically zapping Satoshi's to other people, almost like their likes you know, on Twitter. And uh, I tried out Cash App. So I was using Wallet of Satoshi to, to use the zaps. And I was like, you know what? Let me try out Cash App. And, and I used Cash App. And what was so amazing to me was I went into Cash App. I bought, call it $20 worth of Bitcoin into the, into the Cash App. If I wanted to send that layer one to another wallet, it, it you know, I just put in the, the wallet address for a layer one Bitcoin address and it just sent it. But everything happening on these zaps on uh, Noster is layer two. It's uh, immediately settling lightning layer two. So I go there and I'm zapping somebody's account with some sats and I used Cash App and it just immediately sent the sats. And, and I know that's layer two that's, that's happening. So well, it's already completely seamless on Cash App, whether I'm using layer one or layer two. And I never... Like I just put the the address for layer two in there and it just naturally knew. And if I put layer one in there, it just naturally knew. And so from a user experience standpoint, the user doesn't even have to understand any of that. And I can't, I mean, this is, I don't know the market cap size of, of Cash App and Square, but I mean, it's probably like a $30 billion company that has implemented this. And I think they're the, I think they're the first one that I've come across where it was literally just seamless, whether... I didn't even have to know what I was using. I just knew I was using quote unquote Bitcoin and I could put any address in there and it just worked. Yeah. And, and this, this is the kind of stuff that is known as like the 10 year overnight success. Like if you've been in the Bitcoin ecosystem, you understand that people have been working on lightning for so long, but if you're an outsider, you're going to all of a sudden it's like the light is switched on. It's like, Oh, mm -hmm. whoa, like this is possible. Yeah. And uh, and and all of a sudden, all these like all this concern mongering about like Bitcoin is slow and you can only do three, three transactions a second and it's never going to scale. Like all that is just going poof. Yeah. And then the same thing is happening. I don't know if you've been following that is um, Andrew Poolstar's mini script and all the um, the incredible new solutions that are opening up for uh, Bitcoin custody and basically smart contracts that um, are blowing, totally blowing out of the water these altcoin projects that have been, you know, huffing and puffing that you needed uh, um, individual uh, professor coin that is like specially designed for smart contracts. That is just also going to go poof. And that's also going to be part of Bitcoin's 10 year overnight success is that like, oh, but the fear mongers were always saying like, no, no, no. Bitcoin is just some kind of weird e-gold. You can never build contracts on that. And then all of a sudden, here we are uh, with, with ordinals, with um, confidential um, asset issuance. All of a sudden, all the stuff that supposedly you could only do on altcoins is right here. It's in the Bitcoin world. And it's nuclear proof. Like It has that like really solid bedrock of code that is carefully designed, carefully pen tested uh, for years. It's like the Lego blocks, like, you know, it's it has that internal logic where you almost can't do it wrong. And um, that's just so exciting. That's that's coming. That's happening right now. Yeah. Well, and what I'm so excited about is if they're trying to do this and inscribe it into the base layer, if they do it and there's no actual users and there's nobody that's actually using this thing that they're engineering. They're going to go bankrupt. They're going to run out. Of, they're going to run out of money, and they're not going to be able to afford the fees in order to make these inscriptions and use up space on layer one. So I'm hopeful that uh, it's all just going to naturally, uh, like the fee, and as the fees go higher, it's just going to naturally solve uh, demand for a limited, scarce amount of space uh, every ten minutes. Um, and it's going to incentivize miners to make continue to make the the network more secure. And um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, people have made this comparison with um, you know the Bitcoin blockchain and uh, international shipping. You know, the 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 whole ecosystem of international shipping and 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 the the 
the um the format of the shipping container and that uh, you know one one bitcoin block you can compare to like a big um container ship and you know there's only so many ships and they go pretty slow but every block can contain a huge amount of data right and, mm -hmm. and just like a, every every uh, single container can contain all kinds of stuff and uh, and it's making the world wealthier and it's such a, a great system and like no we don't want bigger containers right mm -hmm. <laughs> um so so it, it is just uh it just trickles down like people just have to slowly understand these these concepts why do you think people have this urge to always step in and think that they have to fix fix the base layer of bitcoin because isn't that kind of like inherently the the issue we're talking about is how how can we cognitively how can we convince people hey keep your hands off of it that is truly the thing that was solved for was this you know laws of physics type going back to that example why, why do people feel like they have to step in and that they have to do this change yeah that's a good question uh, it's probably like there's probably a multitude of like factors that play into that i think one is of course that we've been living in the fiat era since 1913 yes. and um and that there's all these economic theories that that are trying to justify why we need to print money why we need to intervene um and so in a way that that's just been and also why capitalism is flawed and free trade is flawed and so we need all this interventionism um and um it's yeah, almost become the it's, norm, it's, right? We've literally been spoon fed this stuff ever since we yeah. went to school. And, and you don't even have to have studied economics. Like it's in the newspapers. It's and and every time something goes wrong, yeah, like the sorcerer apprentice have to has to come up with some kind of big intervention. Um and, and I think now, interestingly enough, that paradigm is running running on fumes it's kind of like at a dead end and and it's going to start deteriorating and you know in places like argentina like people have been like yeah but i already voted for the interventionists like even young people they're like i voted for christina you know five years ago ten years ago but like everything got worse and worse mm -hmm. so what's the alternative and so i think that's the beautiful thing is that bitcoin is such a constructive project like it doesn't it's not uh it, it embodies very naturally all these all these principles um, that I think people will through osmosis and and just by by handling it, they will start learning learning a, a different way of thinking, integrating some of the thinking that engineers naturally have into people's everyday life when they think about uh, economics and finance and even, maybe even moral things like that. Well, one final question on this: At what point would you say uh, maybe we need to? Uh, look at a change on the base layer? Would it be something like uh, the fees associated with conducting a transaction exceed that of Fedwire and they've been like this for four or five years? Is that when we have to maybe as a community take a, a closer look at what's actually happening? Or do you think that even, even raising the issue is uh, you know, not appropriate? I once was like flipping on Twitter and I said like one day the cost of broadcasting a Bitcoin transaction on the on the Bitcoin blockchain is going to be the same as leasing a shipping container. Hmm. <laughs> I know that's probably that's probably, you know, out there like that's probably excessive, but I you know, still the principle is there. Like there are certain things that are done in the real world on a daily basis by people who are just very deep into a certain market like you know moving a ton of physical gold for example that happens all the time um and it's just a very specialized thing and it's handled mostly by corporations and those kind of things and so if he you know uh, gregory maxwell had a great way of of explaining what the what the blockchain really is from a, a principled point of view he said it's it's basically a court system you know it's it's a, it's a, it's like going to court to resolve disputes and courts are expensive you know and and there are many other ways to prevent disputes to mediate disputes um by technology or by you know, using mediators etc and that's the stuff that happens in the higher layers but if if you want to go to the highest court that's going to be the blockchain and so yeah it's it's i don't think that would be a good enough reason let's the cost of the court are too high it's like no 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 we we capped the amount of disputes that can be resolved every 10 minutes at this this is the cap and so if 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 
you cannot afford to get in that pool you got, or, or to wait long enough to get it, you know, integrated in one of the blocks, then you got to find another way. The only thing over the years that I've encountered that I, that would give me pause is if there was some, uh, if SHA-256 was somehow compromised and, and you know, the basic, um, the, the basic uh, cryptography was uh, compromised because of quantum computing or something like that. But even then, uh, some people I've talked to said that you could probably solve it with the soft fork, uh, which makes sense. It would, it would, it would mean that people who want their, it's almost like there's this biblical flood, right? All of a sudden the land that we thought was safe is not safe and we have to move to higher ground. So you could do that with the soft fork is you create a certain type of uh, Bitcoin uh, UTXO that is more protected against this aggressive form of computing, something like that, or a different form of mining, or I'm probably not explaining it right, but it's it's in that direction so that a lot of people would have to take action, but you would still not hard fork the uh, the protocol. So wow. so just to be to give a short answer, no, I haven't found a reason why anyone would have to hard fork Bitcoin ever. Yeah. All right. So Tur, you have been writing epic uh, profound pieces for quite a while. Um, I'm just going to name a couple. Uh, you have an article called The Bitcoin Reformation, one called Bitcoin and Heavy Accumulation. These were both in 2017. You have another one, How to Position for the Rally in Bitcoin. This was back in 2015 when the price was $200 a Bitcoin. Um, we'll, we'll I'm going to have links in the show notes to all three of these articles so people can go back and, and read them. They are very robust. They go into a ton of detail. Some of the themes that you were writing about back then was scalability, which we just discussed on the first part of the show, user experience, which we also talked about with the Cash App and other uh, wallets that are just way like insanely profound compared to what we were looking at back in this period of time. Regulatory issues, disrupting power structures, commitment to this long-term vision, when you look back and you audit yourself in what you were writing about, is there anything that you feel like you missed or something that you feel like you got really right? Um, and I, I bring this up because we're about to talk about your latest uh, behemoth of a report that just came out that's phenomenal. And so I'm, I'm trying to kind of highlight that to the reader as you're just kind of assessing and auditing yourself. Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, it's easy when I when I read through these old reports it's easy to kind of be like oh damn i could have you know tweaked this or tweaked that um but overall i am really proud i am you know i feel good about the general content um if i have to think about that particular report i would say i was a bit overly optimistic about the liquid network about how that fast that was going to be uh developed or side chains in general which is basically somewhere in the middle between the main chain and the lightning network. It's like the idea that you have a faster settlement and more flexible settlement network. Um, I, I I do think that the conclusion was talking about the next five years. So we're still within that range. Like to mm -hmm. Five years from the report will be 2024. So some of those things could really happen. Um, yeah, and the financialization actually happened, like options and, and um, futures have become an important part of the Bitcoin uh, project. And then I'm glad I didn't venture too far into speculating about what altcoins could do and the things that we could see there because it's it's um it is kind of by nature such an unpredictable space and a lot of it plays on the 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 what is alive at the moment you know like these yeah. fads that come and go and so I'm glad I, di I didn't really pay much attention to that yeah total clownware <laughs> <laughs> a lot um, of it. And a lot of it is, is yeah. kind of showing us what doesn't work. So maybe we should be grateful. Yeah, no, that's a great point. It really is uh, showing you what doesn't work. And and I think some of the technology is things that people can think about is, is how can you incorporate maybe some of these ideas into the base layer? So that's a great way to look at it. Okay, so let's talk about your newest report. Um, how many pages was this? This is like 20 pages or 25 yeah. pages or something like that. So some of the themes you have uh, in this that we can just kind of go one by one here, you say Bitcoin is on the brink of decoupling with stocks and crypto. What what are you getting at here? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I think that the year 2021 was a culmination of, I don't know, something in the air that was like 
peak irrationality or something like that, or peak animal spirits or whatever you want to call it. Um, there was the, what was it called again? Um, for markets at large. Yeah, markets at large. Yeah. So like the Wall Street bets were going nuts and they're going, you know, buying short-term options on AMC and all these crappy companies. And then real estate just totally boomed and peaked. And um, and then in the, you know, I think NFTs were also such a big part of that huge rally. And Bitcoin was kind of caught up in that, mm. um, in that slipstream. Um, and then what we've seen since, like we're only two years later, is that both those markets, like crypto and uh, the the stock markets, but also the bond markets and housing, they're all deteriorating. It's all kind of coming down. And, and it makes sense because uh, we had a huge rise in inflation followed by that. Uh, I think Michael Saylor had a great metaphor of like, it's like a fighter jet that like, you know, goes down to the earth and then goes up <laughs> straight into the air. And, you know, and then the, and then the pilot loses consciousness, you know, it's like, that's kind of what the fed is doing to the markets. Kind of just and the, and the wings get ripped off. Don't forget the wings getting ripped off. He, <laughs> he also included that. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. And so then it's like, all right, well, so this is the economy. This is the $500 trillion economy. So where do we go, right? And mm -hmm. so Bitcoin, to me, is a huge part of the answer. It, it's like we've been stuck in this uh, theater that's now actually on fire, and a lot of the exits are starting to look really bad. You know, mm -hmm. you, people used to flee in bonds, and they used to flee in real estate, and and maybe even, you know, some of the utility stocks are not looking so good anymore. So anyway, so that that's my general framework for why do I think uh, Bitcoin is going to decouple, basically because... And this has been my thesis since 12 years ago is like, if you want to position for an economic depression, you want to have assets that have high liquidity and low counterparty risk. And of course, scarcity, because that, that speaks for itself. And, and that was the big aha moment when I found Bitcoin is like, oh my God, this is, this is a depression instrument. If, mm -hmm. if we're going to have a giant wealth transfer uh, where the economy needs to recalibrate because it's been over investing and, and overextending, Bitcoin is going to be the, the funnel through which a lot of that is going to happen. Hey everyone, it's Clay Fink here. Are you looking for an investment opportunity in a $2 trillion market? Look no further than Atacama, the cybersecurity industry's latest game changer. Atacama has opened its doors to US accredited and international investors alike already attracting over 5,000 investors and $6.5 million in capital. Atacama's recurring revenue model saw 10x revenue expansion in 2022 alone. They have patented technology and large contracts secured, including one with the U.S. Department of Defense. This is a limited time opportunity to get in on the ground floor of a rapidly growing cybersecurity startup. To learn more, simply visit invest.atacama.com dot com slash WSB. That is invest dot atacama, A-T-A-K-A-M-A -A -A dot com slash WSB. Full disclosure, I have personally invested in Atacama's equity crowdfunding round at a $29 million valuation. Please keep in mind that investments in early stage companies do contain risk. As with any investment, crowdfunding investments do offer attractive potential upside but they cannot offer any guarantees of a future return. One of the other uh, main things that you talked about in this new report is Bitcoin nation state adoption is set to become a big theme. I think everybody's well familiar with the El Salvador, but I think a lot of people were looking around and saying, okay, so there's one country, there's really nobody else that's done this. And you're saying at this moment in time, you think moving forward, what, in the next two years that we're going to see a lot of other nation states start mm -hmm. to do something similar? Yes, I think the price will will speak volumes. I think mm. uh, the reason why there's been a delay in adoption, because you think like, oh, El Salvador is first, but they kind of announced pretty close to the top of the market. Mm -hmm. And so then it's like once the, the market goes sideways and it goes down a bit and there's more skepticism, you know, politicians are pretty whimsical. Like they're not going to risk their whole career on, on you know, some something that could be a bubble. They don't really understand yeah. it. And so I think in a way it's good that we had this consolidation period, uh, even though for some people it was brutal, um, financially speaking. Um, yeah, I think it's really good. I do think based on what I've, the conversations I've had with people that know a lot more about this because they're working on, you know, Chivo Wallet, they're working 
they're talking to politicians all the time, um, is that uh, there's still a lot of hesitation when it comes to like boldly doing something so boldly as El Salvador. Like, you know, mm -hmm. he is a bit of a maverick and he is seen that way. Uh, but it, it is possible that we'll have new Mavericks being elected. You know, that's possible. People that run on a Bitcoin ticket that are not in power now. And then also uh, central banks are starting to get really uncomfortable because like their claim to fame, they're kind of like the reason why they have uh, supposedly a strong currency or a strong position is they have that balance sheet that has all kinds of fancy assets and it has gold and this and that. And now those assets, those balance sheets are deteriorating, like the bonds and, and the Forex reserves, they're all kind of declining and, and looking very, very shaky. And so, and then they've been investing in tech stocks, some of these, you know, central banks, and I don't know. And so I think it makes total sense that in the next two years, we'll have some central banks start putting some, some money in Bitcoin. And also an interesting, uh, there's also kind of a game theoretical uh, element at play where of course if you're the first central bank to buy you're going to get a lot cheaper bitcoins obviously uh but there's also like politically speaking people have noticed that the imf has gotten really uncomfortable about el salvador yes el salvador being so bold and being like going against the imf and and no longer being so subservient and so even to like you know um uh, uh, let up a little balloon. It's like, hey, we're thinking about adopting uh, Bitcoin. You know, you're talking to the IMF. It's like, you know, maybe if we don't like your terms, we're just going to switch and we're just going to follow El Salvador. So it doesn't mean they'll do it right away. But, you know, this is starting to become like a political um, bargaining chip potential. And the same is with mining, right? If, if you're cut off from the world, you can be like, let's just, you know, let's just build a bunch of Bitcoin mines or just, you know, have low taxes and we want to foster Bitcoin, a Bitcoin economy in our country because we're a brick, one of the brick countries or, you know, like, I mean, it does. I don't think it's a coincidence that El Salvador uh, adopted Bitcoin because they're landlocked and they have huge amounts of volcanoes. I think there's over 100. Uh, so, so there is that long term potential of becoming a kind of a mining powerhouse. And there's many other countries that have the same problem of energy rich, but but kind of constrained in terms of energy transportation. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of uh, country adoption in Argentina, there's a political candidate right now who looks like he could be a member of the, of the Beatles. Um, and he is uh, he's pro Bitcoin. I know you're familiar with Argentina. So what are your thoughts here? Yeah, Javier Milei. Yeah, yeah. I, I am familiar, although I haven't been in a long time. I, I really want to go back. Uh, I actually learned about Bitcoin in, in uh, Buenos Aires for the first time. Um, yeah, Javier Milei, from from what I've seen so far, is he is a economics professor. He's been teaching economics for over 20 years. Um, when he was a kid in the early, um, I think it was in the early 80s, he was 12 years old and there was hyperinflation raging through Argentina and he said that when he was 12 is when he decided he's going to become an economist. And um, and actually, um, his his uh, his sideburns are probably a, a nudge to, um, I forget his name now, but a famous general in um, in Latin American history who kicked the Spanish out, kind of like the oh. Tom Jefferson equivalent of, um, of uh, Peru and Argentina and uh, Brazil, I believe. And so uh, young people, they they grew up with these stories about this general. And all of a sudden, there's a guy who very much looks like him. Um, so uh, apparently, he's polling tremendously well among the young people. Mm. Um, uh, people are saying that, you know, likely they don't agree with all his economic ideas because everybody's been raised very much in the interventionist mindset. But at least they understand that he stands for something different. He's been advocating for uh, competing currencies. So he wants to put... Um, allow for the dollar to just circulate freely again. And so basically re-dollarize the economy. And then he's he's not been critical of Bitcoin at all. When people ask him about it, he, he, he explains that it's very important that we have private currencies and that central banking is a scam because it it, it, it robs people, uh, the, 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 the populace of um, money by means of the inflation tax. And it's, it's very, very, very interesting how millennials are so galvanized by this uh, this new 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 person and new movement. 
And for people that aren't familiar with Argentina, their inflation for their local currency is 100% annual uh, right now. Bitcoin has already made new highs in that country in their local currency terms. And uh, I recently read that they have cut off uh, citizens' ability to use uh, apps to buy Bitcoin and uh, basically accumulate it through like traditional exchanges like we have here in the U.S. and, and abroad. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's getting really interesting. One of my main concerns on this one, Tur, if I just have to be quite frank, is I, I've been talking a lot about this idea that if you're not a net producer it's near impossible for you to store your savings or your retained earnings in Bitcoin because you, you just, you're a net consumer, right? And all of those bills and all those expenses for net consumers are often in the local currency that they're, that they're living in. And so um, why introduce the insane amount of volatility that you get with Bitcoin when you're a net consumer and you have all these bills that need to be paid by introducing that volatility, sometimes you're making it way harder for yourself in order to complete the obligations that you're already uh, accumulating liabilities on your personal balance sheet. So this applies for the individual. This applies for the for the business. This applies for the country. And so when I look at a lot of these countries where they have really poor currencies, Argentina, you name it, like just go around the world. I'm, most countries are dealing with insane issues with their local currencies. A lot of these same countries are net consumers. They're not net producers, not all, but but a lot. And so where I think it's hard for these, and, and you also look at these same countries and they're heavily influenced by the IMF and the World Bank that just snow continues to snowball and roll their debt so that in nominal terms, the debt just keeps getting larger and larger and literally impossible to repay as they roll into the next loan, which is an even larger amount that they have to borrow just to have liquidity in their system. And so when I look at what's happened in El Salvador, and he absolutely is a maverick because um, they're, they fit that complete description that I just explained. Right. And so many other countries are in that same situation and they're looking at the IMF and they're like, OK, I can get liquidity, which will solve my short term issue. I understand Bitcoin is the solution, but there's no way for me to actually save and store this thing because I'm a net consumer. I'm not a net producer. And so there's kind of this this quandary that that's playing out where maybe the citizens are getting it and maybe the, the some of those citizens are net producers and they can store their savings in bitcoin but as you go up the architecture to the business to the country it's it's really hard for that to flow up just because of the sheer uh overreach that has occurred with the imf and the world bank for a lot of these domains that we're talking about so i'm curious to hear you know kind of a uh, not that I disagree with your with your thesis. I think your thesis is true, and I think we are going to see more of this in the coming years. But that's the hurdle, I guess, that I see as we're as we're looking at it. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that it would be wrong to completely to kind of impose Bitcoinization or something mm -hmm. like that, right? Uh, I think that what we want is let a thousand flowers blossom. And we all speak our minds freely and we have competing currencies in the world where that the artificial tax on Bitcoin is removed, which we totally have, right? If, if you if you save in Bitcoin in, in the US, you're going to pay capital gains tax whenever you sell, you know, sell your money. It's kind of weird, right? You spend money. But the reason why, because it's treated as an investment in many places. So that's basically the only thing you would need to do is just remove that tax and uh, and then let the economy slowly via osmosis and, and kind of like, you know, Bitcoin is going to flow where the resistance is least and, and people that have low time preference and who have the luxury of being able to save will be able to save some in Bitcoin. And then when there's a big bull market, then they have the money to build to build out some infrastructure and start a business. I mean, it's, you know, you're probably familiar with the the little richest man in Babylon book, right? I mean, the mm -hmm. Bitcoin is that kind of money. That was the advice of the wealthiest man in Babylon is like, you just save a little bit of your money over the long run and then when, when the opportunity comes around, you invest it in a business. But with fiat, th that that is taken from you. That opportunity to 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 build a nest egg is 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 rug pulled from you. Um, and and also there's that. 
you know, I, I don't know if it's a, it's a fair analogy, but I, I do, you know, when I, the Bitcoin reformation, I drew some analogies between organized religion and, uh, and money and, you know, and Bitcoin today, there is some example, right. Where there was a new movement, the Protestantism was first just kind of rebelling against the church, but then they did certain things their own way. And in continental Europe, a lot of Protestantism became almost like that imposed version. Like we're going to impose the Bitcoin standards. And then you got a lot of conflict because it was either or, either you were Catholic or you were Protestant. And they kind of both became calcified and and just the source of incredibly, you know, bloody conflicts and, and poverty. Whereas, you know, the, the I think the stellar example of the other way was New York, uh, New, uh, you know, New Amsterdam and then New York City, which had freedom of religion from the get-go. And it just kept on flourishing and flourishing because the market just adjusted and um, and there was this general tolerance where individuals could make their own choices, um, and that's that's what I would like, you know. Let 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 these technologies coexist, and it's way too complicated for you and I individually to figure out what technology needs to be used where. I mean, that's what the Soviets tried to do, right? How many tractors do we need in this area? And like, this is impossible. We need markets to figure those kind of things out. Amen. Mm. Amen to that. Hey, Mm. this was a powerful quote in your new uh, report. You said, generally speaking, we can expect for economic activity to switch from emphasizing the production of consumer goods and services towards goods at the very beginning of the value chain. Explain what you mean by this. I think this is a really profound uh, comment, and I think it can help guide people as they're trying to navigate the chaos in these markets, uh, kind of as a guidestone to to how to think about things from a very uh, first principles kind of way. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to draw an analogy, and it's a very simple one. And I know a lot of people are going to say that's too simplistic and it's not. <laughs> so let, let's try and go there. Um, basically, we know that many economies have been living above their means. They've been you know, getting into debt way too much because the interest rates were artificially low for so long. And so this is the equivalent of having a family living and they, are, they have the opportunity to borrow as much as they want at a half a percent interest per year for however long they want unlimited uh, time to pay it back. So what are they going to do? They're going to borrow lots of money on average, of course. They're going to borrow lots of money. They're going to build a pool in the backyard. All kind, They're going to really have a lot of their spending be focused on consuming, consumer products, clothing, and all these nice things. And then imagine the same situation. The debt stays the same, whatever they, they've accumulated in debt. And then you're like, oh, sorry, guys, we're changing the rules. The debt is now... Um, is now to be paid at 20% interest per year. Like that kind of shock is all of a sudden happening. So so how's the spending going to change within that family? Well, I mean, it's going to be focused on just having enough heat, um, having some food on the table, very basic foods, uh, maybe having some gas for the car. Um, they're probably going to sell some of their cars. They're probably going to downside, live in a smaller house. So, so imagine that happening on almost a global scale. Like that's what we're talking about. And that's that shift. And that's what Austrian econo- economists talk about when they talk about credit expansion during the, 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 the bull phase of the bubble, right? We, we've seen a huge bubble accumulate over 40 years of credit expansion and, and all this spending above your means and now the piper has got to be paid. And so so just think, keep that in the back of your head when you're thinking about investing. Like Apple, yeah, but it's a great company. Yeah, yeah, but they they sell consumer products. Um, you know, a, a lot of the NASDAQ companies, great companies, but it won't matter if the consumer doesn't have the funds to keep um, consuming those products. So it's very simple. And so then what you go back to is, Basically, the market realizes we've been underinvesting in just simple things like pulling oil out of the ground and and you know growing grain and having like a store of value for your family, like because because all of a sudden my pension fund blew up. All of a sudden, my insurance company apparently was invested for seventy five percent in bonds that are evaporating. So my insurance is not going to be worth anything. I need to self insure. How do I do that? Hard money, gold, Bitcoin, those kind of basic things. So, so that's that's my framework going into this depression. I think it honestly, I think it started with the pandemic. I think that's 2020 is is kind of my marker. And in my mind, it's like this is going to be a 10 year period where 
we're going to have some some flare ups and things going to look better for a while and then they'll kind of look worse and we'll we'll try and muddle through. You know, I think it's it's really profound because you're talking about uh, in your example, these these families that locked in rates at zero percent. But it's even more profound than that, Tur, because if you're 60, 65 years old or younger, all mm. you know is that the rates have continued to go down for your entire life. And so there's a c- cognitive conditioning bias that everybody has that they can roll their debt. Like, let's say you took out a loan for 10 years and you didn't really pay back the principal on it. You were making interest payments and you need to roll it. It was, it was always easier to roll it at a lower rate for everybody under the age of 60 or 65 years old that are that are alive today. That was their experience is I could just overconsume. I don't actually even have to pay back the principal. I can just roll it at a lower rate. And so they've been totally conditioned into thinking that they can live in exuberance and just kind of expand their debt load for their whole life. And right. then, exactly. then at the very, the, the icing on the cake is what you're saying, which is, then it got down to literally like a half a percent interest and they really loaded up and they really went out on the risk curve at the at the absolute worst time possible. Often at the advice of their parents who knew the same thing, right? Who I mean, knew like the exact parents, same thing. My parents bought their first house in their early 20s in, in 1982, mm-hmm. 14% interest rate, and they've only ever seen it decline. Yeah. It's exactly what you're talking about. And so, yeah, you're right. I mean, we millennials... Uh, or me, I, I don't know if you're still part of it or not, but um, yeah, barely, it, barely. So it's kind of like you know, it's just it's it's going to be an incredible, incredibly difficult adjustment. You're totally yeah. right. There's that mental cost of of making that switch, and it's also what we've seen is that people who double down on the rolling over, they've gotten the rewards. Like all the books mm-hmm. about how to get rich were always about get you know uh one apartment buy one apartment and then use that as collateral to get more and then use that as collateral it's like the, the sky's the limit and then meanwhile if you're like the the prudent saver you kind of look like a schmuck yeah well yeah there was no way for you to to outperform somebody who was levered like that in a system where uh you know rolling debt just got easier and easier to to play so until yeah. bitcoin until bitcoin yeah yeah what an exciting time um, and I think the really interesting thing is after that, the Bitcoin exchange rate surpasses from the bear market lows when, you know, long term holders are an average underwater and and any long term holders that are spending are capitulating at a loss. Right. On average, um, after the Bitcoin exchange rate surpasses that uh, that level and there's still a dominant predominant majority of, of those coins are held by people that aren't giving them up, that aren't putting them back into the market. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's when things get really, really interesting and price starts to to run like crazy um, because of that supply demand imbalance. It's that simple. 